copy protection, also known as content protection, copy prevention and copy restriction, is any effort designed to prevent the reproduction of software, films, music, and other media, usually for copyright reasons. Various methods have been devised to prevent reproduction so that companies will gain benefit from each users who obtain a copy of their product. Unauthorized copying and distribution accounted for $2.4 billion in the United States in 1990s, and is assumed to be causing impact on revenues in music or game industry, leading to proposal of anti-piracy laws such as PIPA. Some methods of copy protection have also led to criticisms because it caused inconvenience for honest users or secretly installed additional software to watch activity on users' computer to detect copying. Effective copy protection as well as protecting user rights is still an ongoing problem with media publication. Terminology Media corporations have always used the term copy protection, but critics argue that the term tends to sway the public into identifying with the publishers, who favor restriction technologies, rather than with the users. Copy prevention and copy control may be more neutral terms. Copy protection is a misnomer for some systems because any number of copies can be made from an original and all of these copies will work, but only in one computer, or only with one dongle, or only with another device that cannot be easily copied. The term is also often related to, and confused with, the concept of digital rights management. Digital rights management is a more general term because it includes all sorts of management of works, including copy restrictions. Copy protection may include measures that are not digital. A more appropriate term may be technological protection measures, which is often defined as the use of technological tools in order to restrict the use or access to a work. Business rationale, copy protection is most commonly found on videotapes, DVDs, computer software discs, video game discs and cartridges, audio CDs and some Asian VCDs. Many media formats are easy to copy using a machine, allowing consumers to distribute copies to their friends, a practice known as casual copying. Companies publish works under copy protection because they believe that the cost of implementing the copy protection will be less than the revenue produced by consumers who buy the product instead of acquiring it through casually copied media. Opponents of copy protection argue that people who obtain free copies only use what they can get for free and would not purchase their own copy if they were unable to obtain a free copy. Some even argue that free copies increase profit. People who receive a free copy of a music CD may then go and buy more of that band's music, which they would not have done otherwise. Some publishers have avoided copy protecting their products, on the theory that the resulting inconvenience to their users outweighs any benefit of frustrating casual copying. From the perspective of the end user, Copy protection is always a cost. DRM and license managers sometimes fail, are inconvenient to use, and may not afford the user all of the legal use of the product he she has purchased. The term copy protection refers to the technology used to attempt to frustrate copying, and not to the legal remedies available to publishers or authors whose copyrights are violated. Software usage models evolve beyond node locking to floating licenses grid computing and electronic licensing. The term license management refers to broad platforms which enable the specification, enforcement and tracking of software licenses. To safeguard copy protection and license management technologies themselves against tampering and hacking, software anti-tamper methods are used. Floating licenses are also being referred to as indirect licenses, and are licenses that at the time they are issued, there is no actually user who will use them that has some technical influence over some of their characteristics. Direct licenses are issued after a certain user requires it. As an example, an activated Microsoft product contains a direct license which is locked to the PC where the product is installed. From business standpoint, on the other hand, some services now try to monetize on additional services other than the media content so users can have better experience than simply obtaining copied product. Copy protection is not the only way to secure profit against piracy. Technical challenges, from a technical standpoint, it would seem theoretically impossible to completely prevent users from making copies of the media they purchase, as long as a writer is available that can write to blank media. 
The basic technical fact is that all types of media require a player a Euro a CD player, DVD player, videotape player, computer or video game console. The player has to be able to read the media in order to display it to a human. In turn, then, logically, a player could be built that first reads the media, and then writes out an exact copy of what was read, to the same type of media, or perhaps to some other format, such as a file on a hard disk. If to another disk, then the result is an exact duplicate of the copy protected disk. At a minimum, digital copy protection of non interactive works is subject to the analog whole, regardless of any digital restrictions. If music can be heard by the human ear, it can also be recorded. If a film can be viewed by the human eye, it can also be recorded. In practice, almost perfect copies can typically be made by tapping into the analog output of a player and, once redigitized into an unprotected form, duplicated indefinitely. Copying text based content in this way is more tedious, but the same principle applies if it can be printed or displayed, it can also be scanned and ochred. With basic software and some patience, these techniques can be applied by a typical computer literate user. Since these basic technical facts exist, it follows that a determined individual will definitely succeed in copying any media, given enough time and resources. Media publishers understand this. Copy protection is not intended to stop professional operations involved in the unauthorized mass duplication of media, but rather to stop casual copying. Copying of information goods which are downloaded can be inexpensively customized for each download, and thus restricted more effectively, in a process known as traitor tracing. They can be encrypted in a fashion which is unique for each user's computer, and the decryption system can be made tamper-resistant. Methods For information on individual protection schemes and technologies, see List of Copy Protection Schemes or Relevant Category page. Computer Software Copy protection for computer software, especially for games, has been a long cat and mouse struggle between publishers and crackers. These were programmers who would defeat copy protection on software as a hobby, add their alias to the title screen, and then distribute the crack product to the network of RSBBS ES or Internet sites that specialized in distributing unauthorized copies of software. Early ages, when computer software was still distributed in audio cassettes, Software piracy was not as prominent since the audio cassette medium was relatively expensive, copying was time consuming and unreliable, and there was little benefit from making copies. Software piracy began to be a problem when floppy disks became the storage media. The ease of copying depended on the system. Jerry Pornell wrote in Byte in 1983 that CPM doesn't lend itself to copy protection, so its users haven't been too worried about it, while Apple users, though, have always had the problem. So have those who use TRSDOS, and I understand that MS-DOS has copy protection features. Apple and Commodore 64 computers were extremely varied and creative because most of the floppy disk reading and writing was controlled by software, not by hardware. The first copy protection was for cassette tapes and consisted of a loader at the beginning of the tape, which read a specially formatted section which followed. The first protection of floppy disks consisted of changing the address marks, bit slip marks, data marks, or end of data marks for each sector. For example, a PLE Euro unregistered trademark S standard sector markings were D5AA96 for the address mark. That was followed by track, sector, and checksum. D or E B concluded the address header with what are known as bit slip marks. D5AAAD was used for the data mark and the end of data mark was another D or EB. Changing any of these marks required fairly minimal changes to the software routines in Apple DOS which read and wrote the floppy disk, but produced a disk that could not be copied by any of the standard copiers, such as Apple's COPYA program. Some protection schemes used more complicated systems that changed the marks by track or even within a track. 1980s locksmith Pornell disliked copy protection and, except for games, refused to review software that used it. He did not believe that it was useful, writing for every copy protection scheme there's a hacker ready to defeat it. Most involved so-called nibble copiers, which try to analyze the original disk and then make a copy. 
by 1980, the first nibble copier, locksmith, was introduced. These copiers reproduced copy-protected floppy disks an entire track at a time, ignoring how the sectors were marked. This was harder to do than it sounds for two reasons, firstly, Apple disks did not use the index hole to mark the start of a track. Their drives could not even detect the index hole. Tracks could thus start anywhere, but the copy track had to have this right splice, which always caused some bits to be lost or duplicated due to speed variations, roughly in the same place as the original, or it would not work. Secondly, Apple used special self-sync bytes to achieve agreement between drive controller and computer about where any byte ended and the next one started on the disk. These bytes were written as normal data bytes followed by a slightly longer than normal pause, which was notoriously unreliable to detect on readback. Still, you had to get the self-sync bytes roughly right as without them being present in the right places, the copy would not work, and with them present in too many places, the track would not fit on the destination disk. Locksmith copied Apple II disks by taking advantage of the fact that these sync fields between sectors almost always consisted of a long string of FF bytes. It found the longest string of FFs, which usually occurred between the last and first sectors on each track, and began writing the track in the middle of that. Also it assumed that any long string of FF bytes was a sync sequence and introduced the necessary short pauses after writing each of them to the copy. Ironically, Locksmith would not copy itself. The first Locksmith measured the distance between sector 1 of each track. Copy protection engineers quickly figured out what Locksmith was doing and began to use the same technique to defeat it. Locksmith countered by introducing the ability to reproduce track alignment and prevented itself from being copied by embedding a special sequence of nibbles, that if found, would stop the copy process. Henry Roberts, a graduate student in computer science at the University of South Carolina, reverse-engineered Locksmith, found the sequence and distributed the information to some of the seven or eight people producing copy protection at the time. For some time, Locksmith continued to defeat virtually all of the copy protection systems in existence. The next advance came from Henry Roberts' thesis on software copy protection, which devised a way of replacing a plea Euro unregistered trademark S sync field of FFs with random appearing patterns of bytes. Because the graduate student had frequent copy protection discussions with a plea Euro unregistered trademark S copy protection engineer, Apple developed a copy protection system which made use of this technique. Henry Roberts then wrote a competitive program to Locksmith, back at UP. He devised several methods for defeating that, and ultimately a method was devised for reading self-sync fields directly, regardless of what nibbles they contained. The back-and-forth struggle between copy protection engineers and nibble copiers continued until the Apple II became obsolete and was replaced by the IBM PC and its clones. In 1989 Gilman Louie, head of Spectrum Holobyte, stated that copy protection added about 50 cents per copy to the cost of production of a game. 1990s CDR, floppy disks were replaced by CDs as the preferred method of distribution, with companies like Macrovision and Sony providing copy protection schemes that work by writing data to places on the CD-ROM where a CD-R drive cannot normally write. Such a scheme has been used for the PlayStation and cannot be circumvented easily without the use of a mod chip. For software publishers, a less expensive method of copy protection is to write the software so that it requires some evidence from the user that they have actually purchased the software usually by asking a question that only a user with a software manual could answer. This approach can be defeated by users who have the patience to copy the manual with a photocopier, and it also suffers from cracked product becoming more convenient than original, recent practices. It has become very common for software to require activation by entering some proof of legal purchase such as, name and serial, a name and serial number that is given to the user at the time the software is purchased a phone activation code, which requires the user to call a number and register the product to receive a computer-specific serial number. Device ID, specifically tying a copy of software to a computer or mobile device based on a unique identifier only known to that device. To limit reusing activation keys to install the software on multiple machines, 
it has been attempted to tie the installed software to a specific machine by involving some unique feature of the machine. Serial number in ROM could not be used because some machines do not have them. Some popular surrogate for a machine serial number would date and time of initialization of the hard disk or MAC address of Ethernet cards. With the rise of virtualization, however, the practice of locking has to add to these simple hardware parameters to still prevent copying. Another approach to associating user and or machine with serial number is product activation over the Internet, where users are required to have access to the Internet so the information on which serial number is installed on which machine gets sent to a server to be authenticated. Unauthorized users are not allowed to install or use the software. Microsoft's Windows Genuine Advantage system is a far-reaching example of this. With rise of cloud computing, requiring Internet access is becoming more popular for software verification. Beyond online authentication, a standalone software may be integrated with the cloud so that key data or code is stored online. This could greatly strengthen the protection. For example, the software could store a property file or execute a process needed by the application in the cloud instead on the user's computer. Problems and Criticisms The copy protection schemes described above have all been criticized for causing problems for validly licensed users who upgrade to a new machine, or have to reinstall the software after reinitializing their hard disk. Some Internet product activation products allow replacement copies to be issued to registered users or multiple copies to the same license. Like all software, copy protection software sometimes contains bugs, whose effect may be to deny access to validly licensed users. Most copy protection schemes are easy to crack, and once crackers circumvent the copy protection, the resulting cracked software is then more convenient and hence valuable than the non-cracked version because users can make additional copies of the software. Due to this problem, user interactive copy protection by asking questions from manuals has mostly disappeared. In his 1976 open letter to hobbyists, Bill Gates complained that most of you steal your software. However, Gates initially rejected copy protection and said it just gets in the way. There is also the tool of software blacklisting that is used to enhance certain copy protection schemes. Early video games, during the 1980s and 1990s, video games sold on audio cassette and floppy disks were sometimes protected with a user interactive method that demanded the user to have the original package or a part of it, usually the manual. Copy protection was activated not at installation but every time the game was executed. Sometimes the copy protection code was needed not at launch, but at a later point in the game. This helped the gamer to experience the game and perhaps could convince him to buy it by the time the copy protection point was reached. Several imaginative and creative methods have been employed, in order to be both fun and hard to copy. These include, the most common method was often used at the beginning of each game session, but as it proved to be troublesome and tiring for the players, it declined in popularity. A variant of this technique involved matching a picture provided by the game to one in the manual and providing an answer pertaining to the picture. Buzz Aldrin's Race into Space incorporated a copy protection scheme that required the user to input an astronaut's total duration in space before the launch of certain missions. If the answer was incorrect, the mission would suffer a catastrophic failure. Manuals containing information and hints vital to the completion of the game, like answers to riddles, recipes of spells, keys to deciphering non-Latin writing systems, maze guides, dialogue spoken by other characters in the game, excerpts of the storyline, or a radio frequency to use to communicate with a character to further a game. Some sort of code with symbols, not existing on the keyboard or the ASCII code. This code was arranged in a grid, and had to be entered via a virtual keyboard at the request, what is the code at line 3 row 2. These tables were printed on dark paper, or were visible only through a red transparent layer, making the paper very difficult to photocopy. Another variant of this method a Euro most famously used on the ZX Spectrum version of Jet Set Willy a Euro was a card with color sequences at each grid reference that had to be entered before starting the game. This also prevented monochrome photocopying. The codes in tables are based on a mathematic formula and can be calculated by using the row, line and page number if the formula is known, 
since the data would have required too much disk space. The secret of Monkey Island offered one of the most imaginative protection keys, a rotating wheel with halves of pirates' faces. The game showed a face composed of two different parts and asked when this pirate was hanged on a certain island. The player then had to match the faces on the wheel, and enter the year number that appeared on the island respective hole. Its sequel had the same concept, but with magic potion ingredients. Other games that employ the code wheel system include games from Accolade like Star Control. Zork games such as Beyond Zork and Zork Zero came with feelies, which contained information vital to the completion of the game. For example, the parchment found from Zork Zero contained clues vital to solving the final puzzle. However, whenever the player attempts to read the parchment, they are referred to the game package. The in-game help function alluded to this form of control with the response Good luck, Blackbeard to queries that were unsolvable without the original game materials. The Lenslux system used a plastic prismatic device, shipped with the game, which was used to descramble a code displayed on screen. While not strictly a software protection, some game companies offered value-added goodies with the package, like funny manuals, posters, comics, storybooks or fictional documentation concerning the game in order to entice gamers to buy the package. This trend is re-emerging in modern gaming as an incentive to both buy games and discourage their resale. Some games like Forza Motorsport 3 and Dragon Age Origins provide bonus and game material that will only be given if one buys the game new. Video Game Console Systems When Sega's Dreamcast was released in 1998, it came with a newer disc format, called the GD-ROM. Using a modified CD player, one could access the game functionality. Using a special swap method could allow reading a GD-ROM game through a CD-ROM just using common MILCD. Dreamcast sold after October 2000 contain a newer firmware update, not allowing MILCD boot. The XBOX has a specific function, non-booting or non-reading from CDs and DVD-RS is a method of game copy protection. Also, the XBOX is said to use a different DVD file system. It has been theorized that the discs have a second partition that is read from the outside and which give the tracks the appearance that the disc was spun backwards during manufacture. The XBOX360 copy protection functions by requesting the DVD drive compute the angular distance between specific data sectors on the disc. A duplicated DVD will return different values than a pressed original would. The PlayStation 2 has a map file that contains all of the exact positions and file size info of the CD in it, which is stored at a position that is beyond the file limit. The game directly calls the position at where the map file is supposed to be. This means that if the file is moved inside the limit, it is useless since the game is looking outside the limit for it, and the file will not work outside of the limit, making any copied disk unusable without a mod chip or the use of FMCB. FMCB uses the memory card to trick the built-in DVD video software into booting copied games. Before a copied game can be played, it must have been patched with a free application. Nintendo's Wii and Nintendo GameCube have their own speciality format for copy protection. It is based on DVD mini DVD technology. Each disc contains some deliberately placed defects. The exact positions of these defects, which differ for each produced disc, is encoded encrypted in the BCA of each disc. The BCA is readable on most standard DVD ROM drives but consumer burners can reproduce neither the BCA nor the defects. As an additional obfuscation mechanism, the on-disk sector format is a little bit different from normal DVDs. Nevertheless, it can be read using some consumer DVD ROM drives with a firmware modification or debug mode. It is also possible to hack the Wii to install unlicensed software, some of which can use the Wii's own drive to create disk images and then play these copies. The PSP, except the PSP Go, uses the Universal Media Disc, a media format similar to a mini disc. It holds about 1.2 a GB. Although it cannot be copied, one can make an ISO image on a memory card and play it on custom firmware, which can be installed on the PSP. The PlayStation 3 uses Blu-ray BD-ROM discs. In addition to any protection provided by the console itself, 
The BD-ROM format specification allows for a remark which cannot be duplicated by consumer-level recorders. The BD-ROM format, in addition, has a notably large file size in the neighborhood of 40-50 GB per game, making it unwieldy for online file sharing, a major method of video game copying. Some game developers, such as Marcus Person, have encouraged consumers and other developers to embrace the reality of piracy and utilize it positively to generate increased sales and marketing interest. Videotape Companies such as Macrovision and Dwight Cavendish provided schemes to videotape publishers making copies unusable if they were created with a normal VCR. All major videotape duplicators licensed Macrovision or similar technologies to copy protect video cassettes for their clients or themselves. Starting in 1985 with the video release of The Cotton Club, Macrovision has licensed to publishers a technology that exploits the automatic gain control feature of VCRs by adding pulses to the vertical blanking sync signal. These pulses do not affect the image a consumer sees on his TV, but do confuse the recording level circuitry of consumer VCRs. This technology which is aided by U.S. legislation mandating the presence of automatic gain control circuitry in VCRs, is said to plug the analog hole, and make VCR-to-VCR -VCR copies impossible, although an inexpensive circuit is widely available it will defeat the protection by removing the pulses. Macrovision has patented methods of defeating copy prevention, giving it a more straightforward basis to shut down manufacture of any device that descrambles it than often exists in the DRM world. Audio CDs, by 2000, Napster had seen mainstream adoption, and several music publishers responded by starting to sell some CDs with various copy protection schemes. Most of these were playback restrictions that aimed to make the CD unusable in computers with CD-ROM drives, leaving only dedicated audio CD players for playback. This did not, however, prevent such a CD from being copied via an analog connection or by ripping the CD under operating systems such as Linux, which was effective since copy protection software was generally written for Microsoft Windows. These weaknesses led critics to question the usefulness of such protection. CD copy protection is achieved by assuming certain feature levels in the drives. The CD Digital Audio is the oldest CD standard and forms the basic feature set beyond which dedicated audio players need no knowledge. CD-ROM drives additionally need to support mixed-mode CDs and multi-session CDs. The play preventions in use intentionally deviate from the standards and intentionally include malformed multi-session data or similar with the purpose of confusing the CD-ROM drives to prevent correct function. Simple dedicated audio CD players would not be affected by the malformed data since these are for features they do not support a euro for example, an audio player will not even look for a second session containing the copy protection data. In practice, results vary wildly. CD-ROM drives may be able to correct the malformed data and still play them to an extent that depends on the make and version of the drive. On the other hand, some audio players may be built around drives with more than the basic intelligence required for audio playback. Some car radios with CD playback, portable CD players, CD players with additional support for data CDs containing MP3 files, and DVD players have had problems with these CDs. The deviation from the Red Book standard that defines audio CDs required the publishers of these copy protected CDs to refrain from using the official CDDA logo on the discs or the cases. The logo is a trademark owned by Philips and Sony and licensed to identify compliant audio discs only. To prevent dissatisfied customers from returning CDs which were misrepresented as compliant audio CDs, such CDs also started to carry prominent notices on their covers. In general the audio can always be extracted by applying the principle of the analog hole. Additionally, such programs as ISO Buster may be capable of producing hidden audio files. Examples of CD copy protection schemes are Cactus Data Shield, Copy Control, and Data Position Measurement. Other digital media, more recently, Publishers of music and films in digital form have turned to encryption to make copying more difficult. CSS, which is used on DVDs, is a famous example of this. 
it is a form of copy protection that uses 40-bit encryption. Copies will not be playable since they will be missing the key, which is not writable on DVD or DVD RW discs. With this technique, the work is encrypted using a key only included in the firmware of authorized players, which allow only legitimate uses of the work. The controversial Digital Millennium Copyright Act provides a legal protection for this in the U.S., that would make it illegal to distribute unauthorized player seguro, which was supposed to eliminate the possibility of building a DVD copier. However, encryption schemes designed for mass market standardized media such as DVD suffer from the fundamental weaknesses that consumers have physical access to the devices containing the keys, and once implemented, the copy protection scheme can never be changed without breaking the forward compatibility of older devices. Since consumers are highly unlikely to buy new hardware for the sole purpose of preserving copy protection, manufacturers have been prevented from enhancing their DRM technology until recently, with the release of next-generation media such as HD DVD and Blu-ray Disc. This period represents more than enough time for the encryption scheme to be defeated by determined attackers. For example, the CSS encryption system used on DVD video was broken within three years of its market release in November 1996, but has not been changed since, because doing so would immediately render all DVD players sold prior to the change incapable of reading new DVD SA Euro. This would not only provoke a backlash amongst consumers, but also restrict the market that the new DVDs could be sold to. More recent DVDs have attempted to augment CSS with additional protection schemes. Most modern schemes like ArcCore's protection use tricks of the DVD format in an attempt to defeat copying programs, limiting the possible avenues of protection a euro, and making it easier for hackers to learn the innards of the scheme and find ways around it. The newest generations of optical disc media, HD DVD and Blu-ray disc, attempt to address this issue. Both formats employ the Advanced Access Content System, which provides for several hundred different decryption keys, each of which can be invalidated should one of the keys be compromised. Revoked keys simply will not appear on future discs, rendering the compromised players useless for future titles unless they are updated to fix the issue. For this reason, all HD DVD players and some Blu-ray players include an Ethernet port, to give them the ability to download DRM updates. Blu-ray Disc goes one step further with a separate technique called BD+, a virtual machine that can execute code included on discs to verify, authorize, revoke, and update players as the need arises. Since the protection program is on the disc rather than the player, this allows for updating protection programs with MBD's working life by simply having newer programs included on newer discs. Notable payloads, over time, software publishers became creative about crippling the software in case it was pirated. These games would initially show that the copy was successful, but eventually render themselves unplayable via subtle methods. Many games use the code check summing technique to prevent alteration of code to bypass other copy protection. Important constants for the game, such as the accuracy of the player's firing, the speed of their movement, etc. are not included in the game but calculated from the numbers making up the machine code of other parts of the game. If the code is changed, the calculation yields a result which no longer matches the original design of the game and the game plays improperly. Superior Soccer had no outward signs of copy protection, but if it decided it was pirated, it would make the soccer ball in the game invisible, making it impossible to play the game. In Sid Meier's Pirates, if the player entered in the wrong information, they could still play the game, but at a level that would be very hard to make it far in the game. While the copy protection in Zack McCracken and the Alien Mindbenders was not hidden as such, the repercussions of missing the codes was unusual, the player would end up in jail, and the police officer would give a lengthy and condescending speech about software copying. In case of copied versions of Settlers 3, the iron smelters would only produce pigs. Weaponsmiths require iron to produce weapons, so players couldn't amass arms. Bohemia Interactive Studio developed a unique and very subtle protection system for its game operation Flashpoint, Cold War Crisis. Dubbed Fade, if it detects an unauthorized copy, 
it does not inform the player immediately but instead progressively corrupts aspects of the game to the point that it eventually becomes unplayable. The message original discs don't fade will eventually appear if the game is detected as being an unauthorized copy. Fade is also used in Armour 2. They continued these methods in Take on Helicopters, where the screen would blur and distort when playing a pirated copy. More recently, Batman Arkham Asylum implemented a copy protection system where the game disables Batman's glide system and various other features, rendering the player unable to continue beyond a certain point. The PC version of Grand Theft Auto 4 has a copy protection that swings the camera as though the player was drunk. If the player enters a vehicle it will automatically throttle, making it difficult to steer. It also damages the vehicle, making it vulnerable to collisions and bullets. An update to the game prevented unauthorized copies from accessing the in-game internet browser, making it impossible to finish the game as some missions involve browsing the web for objectives. In Earthbound, unauthorized copies of the game will trigger a checksum that makes enemy encounters appear much more often than in an authorized copy, and if the player progresses through the game without giving up, a second checksum code will activate before the final boss battle, freezing the game and deleting all the save files. In an unauthorized version of the PC edition of Mass Effect, the game save mechanism would not work and the in-game galactic map would cause the game to crash. As the galactic map is needed to travel to different sections of the game, the player would be stuck in the first section of the game. If an unauthorized version of The Sims 2 was used, the build mode would not work properly. Walls would not be able to be built on the player's property, which prevents the player from building any custom houses. Some furniture and clothing selections would not be available either. A March 2009 update to the BGI by iPhone app included special functionality for users of the pirated version, the screen would read PC load letter, whenever the user tried to establish a connection to any IM service, then quickly switch to a YouTube clip from the movie office space. Red Alert 2 has a copy protection system, where if a pirated version of it is detected, the player's entire base is destroyed within 30 seconds of the player joining a match. The DS version of Michael Jackson, the experience has a copy protection system where the Vazila noises are heard as the music is playing, the notes are invisible, making the game impossible to play, and the game freezes upon the player pausing it. Older versions of Autodesk 3DS Max use a dongle for copy protection. If it is missing, the program will randomly corrupt the points of the user's model during usage, destroying their work. Older versions of CDRWIN used a serial number for initial copy protection. However, if this check was bypassed, a second hidden check would activate causing a random factor to be introduced in the CD burning process, producing corrupted coaster discs. Terminate, a BBS terminal package would appear to operate normally if cracked but would insert a warning that a pirated copy was in use into the IEMSI login packet it transmitted, where the sysop of any BBS the user called could clearly read it. Urbix Music, a music creation tool for the Commodore 64, would transform into a Space Invaders game if it detected that a cartridge-based copying device had attempted to interrupt it. This combined copy protection and an Easter egg as the message that appears when it occurs is not hostile, the Amiga version of Bomberman featured a multitap peripheral that also acted as a dongle. Data from the multitap was used to calculate the time limit of each level. If the multitap was missing, the time limit would be calculated as zero, causing the level to end immediately. Nevermind, a puzzle game for the Amiga, contained code that caused any pirated version of the game to behave as a demo. The game would play three levels sampled from throughout the game, and then give the message you have completed three levels. However there are 100 levels to complete on the original disc. In Spyro, Year of the Dragon a character named Zoe will tell the player outside the room containing the balloon to midday garden home and several other areas that they are using a pirated copy. This conversation purposely corrupts data. When corrupted, the game would not only remove stray gems and the ability to progress in certain areas but also make the final boss unbeatable, returning the player to the beginning of the game after about 8 seconds into the battle. 
the Atari Jaguar console would freeze at startup and play the sound of an enraged Jaguar snarling if the inserted cartridge failed the initial security check. The lens lock copy protection system gave an obvious message if the lens coded letters were entered incorrectly, but if the user soft reset the machine, the areas of memory occupied by the game would be flooded with the message thank you for your interest in our product nice try. Love BJNJ to prevent the user examining leftover code to crack the protection. An update to the sandbox game Gary's mod enabled a copy protection mechanism that outputs the error unable to shade polygon normals if the game detects that it is pirated. The error also includes the user's Steam ID as an error ID, meaning that pirates can be identified by their Steam account when asking for help about the error on the Internet. The Atari version of Alternate Reality the dungeon would have the player's character attacked by two unbeatable FBI agents if it detected a pirated version. The FBI agents would also appear when restoring a save which was created by a pirated version, even if the version restoring the save was legal. VGA Planets, a play by BBS strategy game, contained code in its server which would check all clients submitted turns for pirated registration codes. Any player deemed to be using a cracked copy, or cheating in the game, would have random forces destroyed throughout the game by an unbeatable enemy called the Tim Continuum. A similar commercial game, Stars, would issue empty turn updates for players with invalid registration codes, meaning that none of their orders would ever be carried out. On a copied version of the original PC version of Postal, as soon as the game was started the player character would immediately shoot himself in the head. The pirated version of Sirius Sam 3, BFE spawns a large immortal monster early on in the game. A pirated copy of Poker Copyright Mon Black or White runs as it was normal, but the Poker Copyright Mon will not gain any experience points after a battle. If Gyakuten Kenji 2 detects a pirated or downloaded copy of the game, it will convert the entire game's text into the game's symbol-based foreign language, Virginian, which cannot be translated in any way. The pirated version of indie game game Dev Tycoon, in which the player runs a game development company, will dramatically increase the piracy rate of the games the player releases to the point where no money can be made at all, and disable the player's ability to take any action against it. In Critex Crisis 3, if a player used a pirated copy of the game, they would not be able to defeat the last boss thus making it impossible to beat the game since the last boss was made invincible even if a player shoots at its weak spots. If a player wanted to fully complete the game they would have to have a legal version of the game. The usage of copy protection payloads which lower playability of a game without making it clear that this is a result of copy protection is now generally considered unwise, due to the potential for it to result in unaware players with pirated copies spreading word of mouth that a game is of low quality. The authors of Fade explicitly acknowledged this as a reason for including the explicit warning message. Anti-piracy, anti-piracy measures are efforts to fight against copyright infringement, counterfeiting, and other violations of intellectual property laws. It includes, but is by no means limited to, the combined efforts of corporate associations, law enforcement agencies, and various international governments to combat copyright infringement relating to various types of creative works, such as software, music and films. These measures often come in the form of copy protection measures such as DRM, or measures implemented through a content protection network, such as Distill Networks or Encapsula. Richard Stallman and the GNU Project have criticized the use of the word piracy in these situations saying that publishers use the word to refer to copying they don't approve of, and that they, publishers imply that it is ethically equivalent to attacking ships on the high seas, kidnapping and murdering the people on them. Certain forms of anti-piracy, are considered by consumers to control the use of the product's content after sale. In the case MPAAV. Hotfile, a judge Kathleen M. Williams granted a motion to deny the prosecution the usage of words she views as pejorative. This list included the word piracy, the use of which, the motion by the defense stated, would serve no purpose but to misguide and inflame the jury. The plaintiff argued the common use of the terms when referring to copyright infringement should invalidate the motion, but the judge did not concur. Anti-piracy and file sharing 
Today piracy is often facilitated by the use of file sharing. In fact, Internet piracy accounts for 23.8% of all Internet traffic today. In an effort to cut down on this, both large and small film and music corporations have issued DMCA takedown notices, filed lawsuits, and pressed criminal prosecution of those who host these file sharing services. Examples On June 30, 2010, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement cracked down on many video hosting websites, including Ninja Video. RIAA using file sharers that share music over P2P networks, MPAA encryption of DVD movies using the CSS cipher and prohibiting the distribution and use of DCSS, while also having the effect of banning free open source DVD player software. Coded anti-piracy, also called CAP codes, as a way to put a forensic identification on the film to trace back illegal copies of films to the source. Metal Gear Solid and many other computer games require a piece of information from the game's dual case for the player to progress after a certain point, making unauthorized copies effectively worthless without the original dual case. However in the present day, said information can be easily be found on the Internet. Microsoft removing Windows Vista and Microsoft Office from various torrent trackers Certain SNES games such as Super Mario All-Stars and Donkey Kong Country may sometimes show warning screens, usually caused by dirty or damaged cartridges or use of third-party peripherals. Earthbound for the SNES, in addition to showing warning screens and drastically increasing the number of enemies, deliberately crashes itself at the final boss fight forcing the player to reset the game. Upon attempting to reload the game, the player's saved games are deleted if the copy is detected to be unauthorized. In Spyro, Year of the Dragon, a character named Zoe will tell the player outside the room containing the balloon to Midday Garden Home and several other areas that they are using a pirated copy. This conversation purposely corrupts a file on game disk called Legal TMP. If corrupted, the game would not only delete certain portions of itself it also makes the final boss unbeatable actually returning to the beginning of the game after about 8 seconds into the battle. Rockman EXE Operate Shooting Star has anti-copying code that causes every step the player takes to reveal an enemy, also in an unauthorized copy. Command & Conquer, Red Alert 2 contained code that detected unauthorized game copies and caused all of the player's buildings and units to explode a few seconds into game play, effectively rendering the copy useless. However this also ended up being a double-edged sword as some players who legitimately owned a copy of the game reported this happening. Gary's mod has an error code on startup for users who pirated it. The code also contained the user's Steam ID, so when the person affected by the error seeks help on the official forums, Facebunch Studios can use the code to ban the user. Though this error code has been known to affect innocent users who have bought the product, their innocence can be proven by simply checking if the corresponding Steam account owns the game. Batman, Arkham Asylum contained code that disabled Batman's glider cape, making some areas of the game very difficult to complete and a certain achievement trophy impossible to unlock. In Serious Sam 3, BFE, if the game code detects what it believes to be an unauthorized copy, an invincible scorpion-like monster is spawned in the beginning of the game with high speeds, melee attacks, and attacks from a range with twin chine guns making the game extremely difficult and preventing the player to progress further. Also in the level under the iron cloud, the player's character will spin out of control looking up in the air. Michael Jackson, the experience for the Nintendo DS makes the game unplayable by making the touch screen controls non-factional and every song turns into the Vizila noise. In Mirror's Edge, during the game, the player's character starts to slow down making it impossible to jump over ledges and proceed further in the game. Grand Theft Auto 4 has the screen shaken with the drunken cam throughout the whole game making it impossible to complete some parts of the game. ARMA2 uses the fade technology to detect pirated copies. If the check fails, the player's guns will have decreased accuracy and will become progressively worse throughout the game. In addition, a drunken vision mode will sometimes activate wherein the screen becomes wavy. Classic NES series features a mirroring. If a classic NES series game is emulated or the cart doesn't feature mirroring, 
the player will fall victim to copy protection. For example, in classic NES series, Castlevania, the player becomes unable to move the character at all. IndyCar series uses the aforementioned fade technology. The second to last section of the manual states, Copying commercial games, such as this one, is a criminal offense and copyright infringement. Copying and resupplying games such as this one can lead to a term of imprisonment. Think of a pirated game as stolen property. This game is protected by the fade system. You can play with a pirated game but not for long. The quality of a pirated will degrade over time. Purchase only genuine software at legitimate stores. See also, digital rights management, digital watermarking, floating licensing, game altering device, license manager, list of copy protection schemes, software anti-tamper, Sony BMG CD copy protection scandal, tamper resistance, trade group efforts against file sharing, references. External links, copy protection in depth, evaluating new copy prevention techniques for audio CDs, C64 Preservation Project discusses and analyzes protections used on old floppy-based systems. Comprehensive article on video game piracy and its prevention.